Welcome to the penultimate session of the International Conference on Disaster Resilient Infrastructure. In this session, we will be focusing on reconstruction and recovery of infrastructure sectors after disasters. Uh, throughout this conference, uh, there has been a discussion on how do we build forward better. You know, uh, I will quote Mr. Akim Steiner in the, pol the first policy forum on the first, uh, first day where he, where he said that after every major event, we ought to be able to build forward better, build more resilient, build greener, and so on. How do we do that? What kind of predictable financing mechanisms? What kind of capacities? What kind of institutional setups do we require to be able to do that? What are the lessons from some of the, the recent events? Uh, to discuss all of this, we will have um, a, a very good session uh, with a variety of perspectives on uh, on the topic of recovery and reconstruction in infrastructure sectors. Uh, the session will be moderated by uh, my colleague, uh, a fellow member of the National Disaster Management Authority of the Government of India, uh, Dr. Krishna Vats. Dr. Krishna Vats uh, is a scholar. He is uh, a former uh, civil servant in India. Uh, he was um, uh, an international civil servant, has worked in many post-disaster operations uh, particularly focusing on recovery across the world. Uh, he anchored one of the largest reconstruction and recovery programs in India after the 1993 uh, Maharashtra earthquake. So he brings in deep practical experience as well as academic rig rigor to this topic. He still calls himself a student of post-disaster recovery and uh, we are delighted to have him here uh, to anchor this session. But before I turn over the floor to him, let's watch a video. Odisha is one of the most cyclone-prone states of India. In 2019, Cyclone Fani hit Odisha. With winds reaching 205 kilometers per hour, the cyclone caused extensive damage to the power infrastructure in the state. But Odisha is learning from the experiences of past cyclones. Over the last decade, through community preparedness, improvements in early warning systems and better coastal infrastructure, the state has reduced mortality from cyclones by more than 98%. Odisha is also working with CDRI to improve its power infrastructure to minimize damage and restore power more quickly after a cyclone. If we want to avoid uh, damage to power infrastructure and minimize disruption of power services, then uh, India as a nation and Odisha as a state and all the states need to invest very heavily in disaster resilient power infrastructure. The Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure or CDRI was launched in 2019 by the Honorable Prime Minister of India, Sri Narendra Modi. CDRI promotes climate and disaster resilient infrastructure. CDRI is currently conducting a study in Odisha to enhance systemic resilience of the power infrastructure in the state at multiple levels. CDRI's project in Odisha will enable the state to move towards building resilient power infrastructure in the short, medium and long term. The study by CDRI will focus on improving preparedness to ensure quick restoration of power after disasters, encouraging better risk assessments in a changing climate leading to improved standards and technology selection, planning for the resilience of future energy systems, improving governance, capacities and knowledge management to achieve disaster and climate resilient power infrastructure. Investment in infrastructure by definition is long term, but in the face of climate change, past is no longer a good guide for the future. Building climate and disaster resilience in power infrastructure ensures a reliable supply of electricity that also enables vital reconstruction and rehabilitation work after a disaster. CDRI and Odisha are jointly trying to improve the resilience of the state's power infrastructure. <laughs> Line to put you, say the sum of the puzzle. Elekitable Pedibus, a cacuzona natilla. 
the CDRI study will provide Odisha with a roadmap for achieving disaster and climate-resilient infrastructure. The coalition will also share the learnings of this study with other cyclone-prone regions in India and the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. A warm welcome to all the panelists, discussions, and the participants from across the world. Thank you to the CDRI for giving me this opportunity to moderate the session on post-disaster recovery and reconstruction of critical infrastructure. It's a great honor. I would like to congratulate the CDRI to, for organizing this conference in the face of all the constraints posed by the global pandemic. We have a great panel of speakers and discussants from different sectors for this session. Private sector, IFIs, and academia. We also feel so encouraged by the, both the strength and diversity of participation from across the countries in the session. It's wonderful to be here. Let's begin this, and we have to wrap this session in one hour. As we see uh, the increasing incidence of climate disasters, climate hazards across the world, the quality, timeliness, and the appropriateness of infrastructure recovery, along with household recovery, has become an important area of public policy and planning. If we just look at some of the post-disaster needs assessment of major climate hazards, and disasters in the recent past, what we would find is that infrastructure damage and loss account for 30 to 40 percent of the total damage and loss. So I have the figure for uh, Hurricane Maria, which struck Dominica in 2017. The total damage and loss was US dollar 1.3 billion and the infrastructure damage and loss accounted for US dollar 441 million. The similar figure for Mozambique, in which uh, when cyclone Idai struck the country in 2019, the total damage and loss was US dollar 2.8 billion, whereas the infrastructure damage and loss accounted for 800 million dollars. In India, we had two major disasters in the recent past. A state of Kerala was severely affected by floods. It, is, it was a $3.8 billion disaster. Infrastructure damage and loss accounted for US dollar $1.5 billion. Cyclone Fani on, in Odisha, on which we have a presentation today, the total damage and loss was $4.1 billion. And the, uh, infrastructure damage and loss accounted for 1.72 billion, almost 42 percent. So uh, the, going by the scale of damage and loss, infrastructure recovery and reconstruction emerges as one of the most important, uh, most significant components of the recovery and reconstruction programs. As the countries undertake recovery efforts, there are three standard steps that we need to follow. A assessment of damage and loss and identification of recovery needs. B recovery planning, financing and implementation. And C building a more resilient system going beyond just the restoration of assets and services. So uh, it's a challenging process as both public and private sector, which own and manage the infrastructure assets and services, approach the process of recovery and reconstruction in their own ways. We now have a standard methodology of assessment, which is known globally as post-disaster needs assessment. However, we have a very limited pool of expertise in infrastructure sectors. The national capacities in these areas are also very limited, and they are just developing. When recovery gets off the ground, there is always a broader question. Are we just restoring the services or are we making them more robust and resilient in the process? How do we introduce mitigation and climate resilient innovations in the process of recovery? 
An important issue here is the prioritization of recovery components. Of course, these are guided by the considerations of revenues and financial resources, but there is also an element of equity as many aspects of household recovery depend upon availability of infrastructure services. We propose to discuss these issues today. There are three speakers and two discussants in the, in the panel. I will introduce them very briefly in the interest of time, their detailed bio, very impressive resume, each of them is available in the information sheet for the session. The first speaker is Mr. Kaushalendra Tripathi, who is Director and Power and Utilities of the Pricewaterhouse Coopers and has more than two decades of experience of working with a wide range of partners. Long time colleague Ayaz Parvez, welcome and he, Ayaz works with the World Bank's Global Facility for Disaster Reduction and Recovery, GFDRR as lead disaster risk management specialist with extensive global experience in disaster risk reduction and recovery. Dr. Anand Patwardhan is a professor at the School of Public Policy, University of Maryland. Previously, he was professor in the Shalis J. Mehta School of Management at the Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay. We have two discussants, Elizabeth, Ms. Elizabeth Pathew and, and Dr. Juliet Mion. Ms. Elizabeth Pathew is the Asia Pacific Regional Representative and Principal, Miyamoto International, a leading structural engineering and disaster risk reduction firm. Dr. Juliet Mia is an experienced civil engineer who leads AROP's infrastructure resilience capability. She is also the deputy director of the Resilience Shift, an innovative initiative to enhance the resilience of critical infrastructure. With this introduction, now I will invite the first speaker, Mr. Koshlin Tripathi, to make his presentation. His presentation is on successes and challenges, lessons from the recovery and reconstruction of power infrastructure post-cyclone FONI 2019. Mr. Tripathi, you are on. And I will, re I will request you to just uh, uh, keep this presentation to 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you. A warm welcome to all present. Let me first very quickly say my thanks to people who have guided me in making this study, Mr. Kamal Kishore himself, uh, Director General Mr. Pondrick, as well as Ms. Mani Karana from the World Bank. The study, uh, focuses on two key aspects. We can move to slide number three, please. And first section is focused on institutionalized processes driving resilience. And component two and three are focused more on hardware-based resilience. In the interest of time today, I will try to breeze through the first few slides so that we can focus a little more on the slides towards the end where some of the key findings can be seen. Next slide, please. So in this slide, it is pretty evident if you look at the map on the top, why state of Orissa was the subject of the study. Pretty much every cyclone that has hit East India in last two decades has battered the state of Orissa with a population of around 42 million and a GDP of around $75 billion dollars. This state therefore forms an ideal case study when we want to study resilience. If you look at the bottom set of numbers that are available on this slide, you can very clearly see that while you know year on year, the number of casualties have been declining, but the impact on infrastructure has been consistently going on. And one of the key reasons of course was that there was more infrastructure to be damaged as we moved on. Moving on. On this particular slide, you can specifically see what we are talking about in terms of cyclone funny. The numbers 11, 9 and 128 tell a story in themselves. One of the biggest cyclones in 128 years, it was moving very slowly and was at 11 days at sea. And there were almost nine times the forecast had to be changed 
in terms of the landfall etc so the unpredictability element was very clearly for there to see at the same time please focus on the numbers on the top see the magnitude of damage on the infrastructure that was done on the distribution networks we are talking of almost 2.2 100000 poles and 110000 kilometers of lines getting destroyed and around 12000 transformers impacted so as a result of that there was a massive damage and such damage we have often seen not only impacts the society in the near term but also impacts the community's ability to recover after such damage has been done moving to the next slide please so next slide basically tells us the story of the restoration the dip that you see on the curve is the point when landfall happened on 3rd of may and you can see prior even to that dip experts who were sitting in the state load dispatch centers had started for safety and network balance reasons to cut down the power supply but then you see the story of restoration start from there it took almost 16 days to reach 84% of rehabilitation around 27 days to reach 93% and a full 60 days before we could finally see the entire network getting restored so this tells us very clearly that once a damage is done then the process of restoration itself is a time consuming and therefore it impacts the rest it impacts the ability of the society to come back online on the next slide you will very clearly see some of the impact that this damage caused we had interviewed a lot of stakeholders on the ground business captains business owners even people who were impacted common people some of which you also saw in the film and there are two or three things i would like to point out look at the first thing on second column monthly work days reduced to around 6 to 7 days and therefore a steep drop in the income also look at the bottom right no relaxation in the fixed charges was one of the challenges that people encountered when they saw that the service was disrupted but at the same time the payments that they have to make for this service were continuing and at the same time for most of the businesses significant loss in revenue because of this disaster so the event came and went on news headlines but for people who were living it it continued to ail them for a long time to come on the next slide i am telling you a very simple story that the story is that when you have to build resilience and now that we are looking at the analytical aspect of things how do we go about it one of the best way is to use a scientific approach to building resilience because resilience is both a long journey and an expensive journey and we saw in the previous session on finance that how difficult it is still to organize finance for resilience related activities so in this slide what we are talking about is how to go about hazard prioritization and vulnerability assessment of various components of the distribution network so that resilience is which is very relevant to the disaster or the hazard that a specific component will face let me elaborate it with an example on the next slide for example if you are looking at a zone which is suffering from highest wind speeds which will be usually areas which are around 20 to 40 kilometers from the coast it might be very useful to from a distribution network perspective to have underground cables there to have a gis substation there if i am looking a little farther away it might make more sense to continue existing with the overhead infrastructure but bring in relevant codes and standards to make sure that that is infrastructure is constructed to those standards and even further away maybe 100 kilometers or so we can get by just by getting away with you know key aspects of vegetation management making sure that there is rewiring that is done which is relevant to that area and finally i will come to the last slide of this presentation and this is the other reason why orissa was chosen over two decades officers and administrators like mr pradeep jena mr ahmed biswa sharma mr nikunj dhal ensured the lessons were not only learned but were institutionalized in various processes let me take a few examples one we are talking about basic disaster management plan as well as bcp business continuity plan availability of backup power 
and availability of critical infrastructure to keep up that backup power. Even simple things like database and repositories of who can be the critical suppliers, who can, who can be reached, for example, for trained workers for restoration are going to be very important when the disaster restoration needs to happen. There can be a lot of things I can talk about, uh, procurement manuals which are used in emergency. We can talk about community resilience and how to go about building it. Financing mechanisms and SOPs is something we discussed in the last slide. But in the interest of time, I will simply, you know, rest my case by saying a couple of things. First, there is universal applicability of institutionalized systems and processes which play a very key role in creating resilient power infrastructure. And second, we believe that from Orissa, we have seen that there are clear action areas that enable even resource constrained societies to take meaningful first steps toward building resilience by institutionalizing and taking these processes to the natural conclusion. With that, I will thank Mr. Watts for giving me this opportunity and thank you all for listening patiently. Thanks, Mr. Tripathi. That was a great presentation. Uh, I think you brought out the dimensions of the damage and loss, the various resilience solutions, and uh, your emphasis on building uh, institutional uh, strengths to deal with uh, these disruptions and uh, build greater resilience. Um, we would like to uh, uh, have some reflections from the discussants. You know, I would um, ask the first question to Elizabeth. You know, um, uh, drawing upon this uh, presentation, you know, you, uh, Mr. Tripathi just mentioned that you know villages took a lot of time to uh, to get the power back. The downtime was very very high. Recovery took its own uh, was uh, um, on its own timeline. So considering the time that is taken to uh, um, make these systems recover, can you, you know, can you suggest some practical and operational ways in which you can work with the, we can work with the countries and governments to do it more quickly and, and uh, to build the systems back on, 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 on uh, and, and provide the services as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vatsa, and to the CDRI for this opportunity. We are very uh, delighted and privileged to be among such an eminent group of speakers and participants. So thank you very much. As you know, you, you alluded to, resilient infrastructure is about more than just the hardware. It's about people and households for whom the quality infrastructure is a link to better lives better education, better health, and in the case of disaster resilience, it is about saving lives and reducing the economic and social impact after a disaster. So really key is, of course, getting those response platforms in place before they are needed and supporting building a culture of preparedness. You know, the broad coalition of actors, national and local, who are already there. The first responders, the technical bodies, the members of academia, members of the private sector, policymakers, and others who are really central to the resilience agenda are the ones who need to drive the conversation. And really then against this backdrop, we have three main roles. The first of which is to really push the spotlight onto the good work that is ongoing and give it the platform and the visibility that it needs to flourish. The second is really to act as a catalyst uh, in the way in which we contribute to the knowledge base and the resilience dialogue, connecting dots and helping to really catalyze the process. And the third is really to work hand in hand as partners to bring the various pieces, the players and the technical contributions together in an effective and actionable way that makes sense for the specific context rather than providing any kind of step-by-step -step playbook 
And, you know, we have been doing this, uh, an example is across Latin America and the Caribbean in, in six or seven countries, really starting from the evidence base of let's take seismic risk, presenting a scenario of what could happen, volume of debris, number of buildings that could come down, numbers of internally displaced, and then use that information to really drive impact and bring those multi-stakeholders around the table, public, private, first responders and say, okay, if this happened tomorrow, are you prepared? And if not, what are the gaps that you see from where you sit? And then really working with them to prioritize those gaps, address those gaps in a way that's going to make sense for their context. So, we see over and over again things like debris management becoming an issue, the rapid damage assessment capabilities that you alluded to earlier um, being locally available, uh, interagency collaboration, communication, decision making processes around financing. These are issues that come up over and over again that we then work to direct to address. So. I mean, all of this is about reducing downtime and moving quickly into reconstruction in a way that is going to be sustainable and practical. Back over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. That was a very uh, appropriate, I think, response to the, you know, this very difficult challenge of restoring the services and uh, working closely with the governments to, uh, uh, get the systems back on. I will now uh, direct the second question to Juliet Mia. Um, and the question is, if the impact of power infrastructure failure rapidly cascades into other sectors, how do you think we can build the understanding of these interdependencies into our recovery and response? Juliet. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Batzer, and thank you for the excellent um, case study. And I think this is a an important issue across all of the sort of infrastructure sectors that we look at the issue of interdependencies and cascading failures, maybe more than anywhere else in the power sector. And as increasingly, as we move to more electrified systems in the um, target for net zero, as we move to more digitally connected infrastructure systems, this very close coupling with the power sector and the dependency on power really is going to cascade through into the other systems. So I think we can't remove that risk of cascading failure, but there are things that we can do in advance. And this comes back to the, the message of the presentation and to Elizabeth's response that preparing in advance and having the knowledge and understanding of those interdependencies will be really important in the recovery phase. Sometimes that's as simple as knowing who to contact. We tend to be very fragmented in the governance of our different infrastructure sectors. Um, and that needs to be, you know, that information needs to exist beforehand. So I, I suppose the key thing is how, how do we remove the fragmentation across the different sectors which are so closely coupled and there are measures and steps towards that before the event, during the event and again learning from lessons like Orisha um, for the post event how we, how we build back better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Juliet. And uh, we know for sure uh, in Odisha the failure of the power sector had the serious impact on health sector. You know, so many hospitals had very impaired functioning for quite some time. So uh, the, the critical interdependency has much wider implications and uh, I think uh, that needs to be addressed. And now I would like to go back to Mr. Tripathi you know, and request him to reflect upon some of these uh, issues raised by our discussants. And, uh, Maybe, you know, uh, suggest, ask him how we can improve the knowledge base as, uh, you know, mentioned by Elizabeth, how we can connect the dots with, you know, so many actors engaged in this area. And one more question, how do we, uh, you mentioned about the building the institutional systems, memories, uh, how how would you like to 
uh, see it reflected actually in the working of the government and other partners. So, if you could just respond to some of these issues, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, so one of the key aspects when we look at particularly power sector and when we start looking at the resilience in there is that it is a regulated sector. So, whatever expenditure that needs to happen has to also somehow get read, reflected back in the tariff. So, therefore, there is a very clear need to do two things. One, we need to balance the hardware side of the resilience with impact minimization through institutionalization of certain processes, which we have talked about earlier as well. Now, when you talk about institutionalizing the processes, one of the key aspects is that we have seen particularly in case of Orisa, it was the personal endeavor of bright officers which ensured that over decades the knowledge was accumulated and passed on to each successor. But in the process, we also saw some institutions get created. For example, OSDMA as well as the ODRAF which are the Rapid Action Forces and the Disaster Management uh, Organization within the state itself. But there is still a lot of knowledge which is out there with the practitioners today which needs to be codified and not only be kept for posterity but also made available to similar circumstances that might occur elsewhere in India and even globally. So that is where the process of institutionalization uh, becomes uh, very important and we believe that uh, you know our study will possibly allow us to take the very first steps in doing that particular aspect. And through the knowledge base of CDRI, this will hopefully get shared widely and everybody will be able to benefit thereof. Thank you. I just want to probe it little further, you know, unlike, uh, you know, disaster management, you know, where a large number of actors are involved, infrastructure recovery and resilience is a very specialized and highly knowledge intensive area. And uh, given the constraints that exist within the governments, what do you think should be done to improve the availability of knowledge or the government's access to the expertise? Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. I think forums like these, I think, are very important in that particular aspect because, for example, while we were working in our own limited way, we were not aware of such wide range of expertise that is otherwise also available which can be reached out to and can therefore be accessed when we are talking about creating this knowledge basis. So I think one of the most important aspects that I think has been achieved by CDRI in this particular conference is bringing together various experts and hopefully this will kick start a process of collaboration that each of us can you know take uh, further down. Specifically on the government's ability to access, I believe codification of that knowledge, creation of the SOPs and I think Elizabeth mentioned about databases. Even databases can play a very critical role when it comes to success. And therefore, all of such efforts need to be put together and I believe again like I, I would say that part of this study deals with that particular aspect where we are creating all of this knowledge which can be therefore easily accessed and shared across the participants and through collaboration, hopefully it will have a wider reach. Thank you. So reassuring to hear that. Now I think we will turn to the next presentation. Um, Ayaz Parvez, it is now your turn. Uh, Ayaz, as I mentioned, is from the GFDRR, the World Bank and uh, he has very extensive uh, experience of conducting the assessments and planning recovery programs across the countries. So I, I invite him to make a presentation on global challenges and solutions towards resilient post-disaster infrastructure recovery. Ayaz, floor is yours and please keep it to 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Krishna. Uh, you know, uh, good afternoon and, and good morning for uh, all who are connecting from my time zone. Uh, you know, first of all, I, on behalf of the World Bank, I'd like to congratulate CDRI and Government of India on the successful uh, uh, holding of this event. Uh, and we are uh, working closely with CDRI at various levels uh, and, and, and hope to take the partnership forward. Uh, uh, so, 
can we just move to the next slide please so you know i, I think uh, uh, presenters before have focused a lot on on sector specific issues on resilient infrastructure uh, what i intend to do is to is to broadly cover the broader policy and institutional uh, issues uh, that affect uh, uh, resilient recovery you know we have uh, learned a lot and myself and krishna have been working a lot on uh, you know i think over 40 50 such assessments uh, but you know we have learned a lot but we have also unlearned a lot and and you know uh, we have also you know uh, uh, developed tools uh, that can you know help uh, with 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 making uh, resilient uh, with making recovery efficient effective sustainable resilient Uh, but also we keep repeating some of the same mistakes over and over again globally so it's a, uh, my intention would be to highlight some of the tools uh, that are uh, available to this effect and you know also draw upon some of the lessons that we've learned in the process now the presentation would focus on the three aspects that and three phases that i think krishna also alluded to in his opening remarks one is what are the peculiarities and challenges of uh, infrastructure assessment and resilience building in in actual post disaster assessments number 2 is how do we uh, uh how do we you know uh, take this to the next level of planning and designing infrastructure uh during the actual process of uh, post disaster reconstruction and recovery and third is how do we build greater preparedness and, and country systems uh, towards this effect uh, next slide please uh so you know uh, i think uh, you know uh, one of the things that we have felt in most developing countries and even actually in in developed countries you know i uh, uh, where i had the privilege of working uh, right after disasters there are huge capacity constraints uh on on side of uh, you know a lot of governments on uh, doing infrastructure assessment efficiently and while we uh, also be cognizant of the of the requirements of developing strategies that can ensure resilient infrastructure recovery you know there's an over reliance frankly on institutions such as us there is a like world bank undp the european union we have been taking the lead in supporting governments here and there uh but also there is probably a lack of market capacities in this area which need to be built so that's one of the key things that we need to look at a uh, second uh, we have a, a huge amount of uh, of uh, uh, inconsistencies efficiencies in 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 the way a baseline information is available on the various infrastructure sectors and believe me baseline information is as critical for uh, for effective assessment as uh, as the actual uh, impact assessment that is done after a disaster third we have huge restrictions on what kind of infrastructure is covered mostly uh, community infrastructure is often neglected because it's not really part of the national accounts and other reasons a lot of private infrastructure it gets excluded uh, unwittingly from these assessments and because of various constraints of scope and methodology and, and then we have various techniques that are available inventory based techniques are those which look at detailed data collection after impact versus relative to baseline techniques which are most in more in more modern and more quick rapid assessments we use a, a rely a lot on these relative to baseline assessments and i'll speak about that a bit later but the, basically my key message is that you know there are limits you know often we as we see crises as opportunities but remember there are a lot of limits to this uh, uh, opportunity and you know the trick is in making sure that we are uh, you know we have a sustained policy commitment we have financial resources and a sustained momentum towards making resilient recovery happen you know and uh, uh, financial and budgetary constraints often come in the way next please uh, so uh, uh, just moving in the same vein you know uh, traditional pdnas obviously have the advantage of you know uh, of of having uh, intensive rigor but also sometimes can slow down the process in a lot of cases you know uh, governments want to quickly get on with the assessments to move on into actual reconstruction and recovery so the contemporary rapid assessments that have been developed are are an area where i think we need to focus more on making sure and some of these assessments are uh, have at times neglected the rigor that is needed particularly when it comes to the resilience building element you know because resilience building assess, uh, assessments require a different kind of uh, analytical rigor when it comes to understanding losses but also importantly when it comes to developing sector specific recovery strategies so uh, you know we need to still i think work further on tools to come to an optimal level where we use traditional methods of pdna as well as mix them with this new techniques that have come in the market which rely on 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 satellite imagery use of cell phone data social media analytics and uh, both so the the trick is in finding the right trade off between quality uh, rigor and timeliness 
uh, and uh, obviously building a better estimating the actual needs are not easy as well you know the 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 uh, the world has modulated across empirical approaches which lie just simply on using a certain factor and applying it over needs estimates to come up with estimates versus very detailed cost models and unfortunately the pdna methodology itself does not allow us the time and space to be able to do detailed costing so a lot of this has to be uh, moved to the actual implementation stage uh, and then there are obviously diverse quantification approaches available across sectors that need to be made more consistent next uh, so, uh, in terms of uh, uh, improvements, you know, I think uh, one thing that is very important that we've been discussing this uh, a lot is the neglect of community infrastructure. You know, often this happens because there is a lack of uh, adequate policy recognition of community infrastructure. The baselines are not available in national accounts. There are lack of assessment methodologies. A lot of civil society partners do rigorous assessments, but they're often not aligned with the public sector assessments. There are lack of uh, basic engineering standards lack of financing, the lack of commitment. And, you know, some of the solutions lie probably in, in making sure that, you know, this is uh, duly acknowledged and institutionalized in government systems uh, as, as an important part of the infrastructure uh, value chain that needs to be uh, uh, addressed uh, in, 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 in conducting these assessments. Uh, second is, uh, you know, uh, we need to develop better, better, you know, engagement models for engaging civil society and other community actors in carrying out these assessments and, and developing more systematic diagnostics. Next. Uh, now, if, if I were to you know move from, from assessment to actual recovery planning, and I understand the time is short, so I will try to be as quick as possible. Uh, you know, the, the problem uh, that I have often faced is that after doing a post-disaster needs assessment, we often lose traction. And you know, everyone goes into their own silos and develop their own projects. There's a lack of a harmonized coordinated approach across projects. And that means that you are, you know, there are so many uh, uh, inconsistencies in the way similar projects uh, addressing similar infrastructure are addressing resilience in very, very different ways. So, uh, and there is a neglect of critical basic infrastructure. Uh, and, you know, obviously the bigger, flashier infrastructure takes precedence over, over, over uh, you know, over the smaller scale basic infrastructure that is absolute, actually more critical to restoring livelihoods and basic access needs of local communities than the fancier, fresher infrastructure. So obviously there has to be a recognition of that. And then uh, uh, there are uh, issues of policy uh, consistency, uh, operational harmonization, and other uh, public sector policy and institutional constraints. Next, please. So, you know, uh, where, uh, you know where, uh, I think uh, we have experimented successfully over the last, I would say, decade or so in developing, uh, uh, you know, programmatic recovery frameworks that address some of the issues that I raised in the last slide. You know, these frameworks uh, look at four elements of recovery. They look at institutional frameworks for recovery, coordination mechanisms, look at policy frameworks for recovery, look at systematic prioritization of needs beyond uh, assessments, and they look at consolidated aid, output, and results monitoring systems. So I think uh, this is a vast science in its own, but, you know, we, have, we found out that, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, and uh, one thing to be remembered uh, on this is that recovery framework is not a document which is static in time, but it's more of a process of engagement that needs to continue throughout the process of recovery uh, implementation, and that has been uh, that could hold the key to how recovery uh, is can be made more efficient, effective, and resilient. Next, please. Now, in terms of infrastructure specific solutions, you know, uh, I think one of the key things is that, you know, beyond PDNAs, we need to carry out sector specific assessments during actual implementation. And the trick is to do them quickly uh, and to identify what actually is cost affordable resilience building in every sector. And there are no set standards for it in most countries uh, on building back better or building back smarter, which is another way of, of you know, of, of calling building back better, you know, uh, building back better, which is more cost affordable. So uh, the elements of building back better that we've often taken into account uh, include structural resilience building, looking at structural elements, looking at right sizing, right siting of infrastructure, looking at greening and climate change. And then obviously the trick lies in implementation towards improved project management, quality assurance, because even if you have the best standards, there's no assurance that you'll actually be able to achieve resilience through the implementation process. Uh, I mean, we have talked uh, when we had uh, uh, about uh, you know, uh, the neglect of uh, private infrastructure. So some of the framework approaches that have imagine, uh, emerged uh, include a better process for harmonization of investment planning across public and private infrastructure. That's, 
is the uh, top uh, in the bottom uh, part of the screen so you know there are four possibilities that need to be synchronized together how is public infrastructure created using public financing the simplest solution how is public infrastructure created using private financing and private financing private infrastructure using private financing and finally private infrastructure will build through public financing so these are four you know different uh, 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 or four variations of 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 what need to be harmonized to make sure that we have holistic cross the board resilience across a private and public infrastructure move on um uh, you know uh, and so one of the the, the the trick lies in in more systematic and criteria based prioritization of infrastructure needs and uh, i think krishna talked a little bit about the importance of having equity built into it so we have formalized a uh, 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 developed a full process of how prioritization uh, needs to be done beyond post disaster needs assessment that is criteria based that systematic and that accounts for various policy considerations importantly looking at what sources of financing are available so that's something that is key to making sure that we have at least some level of infrastructure resilience built into our uh, uh, in, into the various sector recovery strategies and actual implementation models next please and uh, just moving on finally to the last part you know is how do we build greater preparedness for uh, for resilient infrastructure recovery you know the trick is obviously lies in greater recovery readiness and preparedness uh, the problem sometimes can be that when governments do these assessments themselves in in various parts they probably lose a little bit of that credibility that comes with having international association uh, institutions associated with it so the trick is how do we bring in both elements while fully implementing this through government systems so there are five areas to look at one is to improve that local and national capacities for recovery assessment and planning number two is strengthening policy frameworks and sector strategies for recovery third is strengthening prior institutional frameworks for recovery fourth is financial systems for recovery and fifth and very important performance management systems for recovery have to be strengthened move on finally you know just to just to summarize you know i think the the four key messages are we need to uh, you know uh, further improve assessment methodologies further institutionalize them in government systems we need to adopt the use and customize the use of programmatic recovery frameworks in actual implementation there has to be a greater effort on standard setting for resilient infrastructure design and implementation and finally there has to be a greater focus on strengthening systems for uh, preparedness and readiness systems for recovery planning and, and, and ultimately that uh, lies uh, th therein lies the key to longer term reform in this particular sector With that i'd like to thank you and uh, back to you dr vasta thank you thank you ayaz that was a, a great uh, panoramic presentation of all the you know uh, functions related to recovery right from the assessment to planning to preparedness and implementation and you raised so many issues there i think you know it's 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 a it's a great overview thanks a lot you know and uh, you know the, some of the issues that have been raised uh, i would like to on, on on those issues i would like to turn to the discussants uh, uh, one is of course the assessment you know and and no in the in the past we have contacted miyamoto uh, for assistance towards assessment you know i would like to know from you how can a private sector firm or academic institution support the governments in conducting the assessments and building capacities more so when some of the governments work in a very resource constrained situation you know and uh, the resources for for such uh, exercises are always limited so if you could uh, suggest some practical ways of you know building collaborations for uh, assessments and capacities that would be great thank you excellent yes so key to this process is to sustaining that commitment over time is the local ownership and that it is country led so it's really critical to look at institutional bodies that remain including academic institutions technical bodies um, engineering associations and looking at ways to build that local capacity by strengthening curriculum investing in training um, with the whole idea of increasing efficiency by having that capacity local that you've got resources that you can call upon that are already there that are built within the system that are already trained up their curriculum is developed it's part of the ethos
um, of training up the technical community and, and integrated within the academic infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. And now I will turn to Juliet. Um, Ayaz uh, alluded to recovery preparedness, and, and that's a, it's a uh, big service line that has come up in the recent way. And what do you think could be the role of the public sector and the private sector in developing this recovery preparedness within the government systems and within the public uh, um, sector companies? So you know, some, some insight from you would be very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. And I think that this recovery readiness is, is such an important concept in, in the sort of pre and post disaster. And I think for the work that I do in Arab and as Resilient Shift, we're, we're not the emergency responders, the emergency managers. I see our role as being mitigating the impact of disasters in advance, but also this issue of enabling the response and recovery I don't love the concept of talking about a disaster as an opportunity, but we have to be pragmatic and say there is a window in which we can transform, we can build to a new normal rather than just coming back to, to where we were. I know there's a, there's a lot of discussion at the moment around doing that post-COVID. And for me, I think, um, I love that I has mentioned that the focus on the flashier infrastructure, we shouldn't have that if we have our recovery plans in place in advance, if we understand the vulnerabilities and the needs. And for me, probably most important is not to recover from events and events in the way of fighting the last war or thinking about the last hazard, but to put those measures in that will you know, prepare us for the next surprise or the next unexpected event. So I think that's where that's where the opportunity is and that's where recovery plans in advance are essential. Thank you. Thank you, Juliet. That, that was uh, very good to uh, hear. I know we have worked a lot on recovery preparedness and, you know, this is uh, an area which is uh, expected to grow. Um, now, uh, I as I cannot get back to you due to the time constraints. I will now uh, move on to the uh, third speaker, uh, Professor Patwardhan. Uh, Professor Patwardhan, I had just raised the issue of prior prioritization of recovery components, you know, the, how community infrastructure gets neglected, how some of those areas which, are, which directly benefit the people they need to be highlighted in the course of recovery planning and implementation. So I think these are some very important issues and uh, uh, which uh, I hope you would uh, be able to present in your third presentation, which is uh, uh, the resilience, recovery as a dimension of resilience. So over to you, Professor Patwardhan. And please, 10 minutes, you know, we need to uh, finish it very soon. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Watts, and, and again, uh, a real pleasure to be here, um, and thanks very much to the organizers for giving me this opportunity. I am mindful of the time, so I will, I will try and rush through perhaps some parts of the presentation a bit quickly. I think my approach uh, really complements uh, what we have heard so far from the other speakers, and, I, and what I'd like to do is reflect a little bit on some of the larger scale issues around recovery and how they relate to the overall resilience, not just of infrastructure or particular assets, but really of people and communities uh, and regions. So I think I'd like to sort of make that as one of the uh, ideas that I'd like to leave leave this, uh, this audience with. And to start with, just as a quick preview, I think in, uh, from my perspective, as someone who's worked at the interface of climate change adaptation and, and disaster risk, uh, it is that the recognition that changing climate, I think, really requires us to rebalance this emphasis across the domains of risk reduction, protection, and recovery. Uh, I think climate change and the increasing frequency of of hazards is going to make it much more important for us to focus on both the risk reduction part, but also uh, the recovery part as a way of building resilience. Uh, I talked about recovery as a kind of a dynamic multi-scale process. That is something I'd like to talk about. And then I think I'd like to touch a little bit from our own work that, that I think highlights how important distributional and issues and socioeconomic factors are uh, we understand that they're important for impacts and vulnerability, but they're also important for recovery processes. So I think, in my mind, the idea of smart recovery is addressing some of these structu underlying structural uh, deficits and socioeconomic factors that make us vulnerable in the first place. 
Um, next slide, please. I think I can skip this. Uh, this, this audience needs no real uh, um, uh, need to, to address the question of this, uh, the fact that there are increasing risks to climate change, both because of increasing exposure and because of intensification of the hazards. Next. Um, I think we can, we can move forward from here. Next slide, please. Uh, just to illustrate that we still are focused on emergency response, which dominates sort of global flows uh, in terms of international aid, um, with slightly less emphasis on uh, the reduction and uh, the recovery part. Next, please. And so I think in so at some level, this shift in emphasis is, is something that is needed and hopefully is happening. Next. So coming to the whole question of recovery and it's uh, and sort of it, as an important dimension of resilience, uh, and this has been mentioned by other speakers that the emphasis traditionally has been on restoration. How do we get back to a pre-disturbance state? But the pre-disturbance state was often making us vulnerable in the first place. So which means that we really need to move to a different state. And there's three aspects of the recovery process that I'd like to touch upon briefly: the, the notion of scale. Uh, the notion of dynamics and the notion of distribution. Uh, next, please. You can skip this. So if you come to the first issue of scale, and, and we have heard a lot about uh, asset restoration, whether it's a power systems, it's water. Uh, but I think those are kind of the first step into more complex services, uh, which are important for community and, and household well-being, whether it's education, whether it's health, are schools open? Can students get to schools? Are uh, uh, health services functioning? Can we get access to healthcare? Which, of course, depend on the underlying infrastructure assets, but they are more complex systems. And then at the end, and in, in terms of the longer term, at the end of the day, we also need to worry about, do we have economic functioning? Do we have jobs? Uh, what is happening to property markets? So I think this notion of thinking about recovery as a multi-scale process occurring or different uh, levels of system complexity and over different time scales is, is important and understanding the interrelationships across those scales is important. Next. And these time scales can be quite long, right? So we've, we've heard the uh, examples of, of asset restoration, which could be days to weeks. Uh, the top line, uh, top graph there shows sort of the restoration process post Hurricane Sandy. Uh, the 2005 floods uh, in Mumbai. But as you go to higher scales of recovery and you start looking at endpoints such as employment, jobs, uh, property markets, economic growth, you can have recovery processes that can take years uh, and longer. So this, uh, the right-hand panel shows you that employment uh, in New Orleans is still well below uh, pre katrina levels. And you see a recovery process uh, that has been fairly slow, which kind of suggests that when we start thinking about recovery, we need to really think of these multiple time scales and how do we uh, uh, not just uh, restore, but really uh, get functioning uh, from an economic perspective um, uh, and whether disaster impact could lead to sustained uh, change in the underlying baseline for a region. Next. So I talked a bit about scale. Uh, I talked a bit about the the both the institutional and the system scale, but also the time scales. Um, and then we come to questions of uh, distribution and equity. Uh, and I think those are very important when we think about recovery processes. Who takes the longest to recover? So if we look at the uh, restoration, for example, even of power, uh, who is in the tail of that distribution? Um, are there systemic and systematic biases that lead certain households or certain communities worse off? Um, how does that relate to underlying structural characteristics, whether it has to do with income, poverty, marginalization, other factors that not only make households more vulnerable in the first place, but maybe also give take them longer uh, to recover? And what does these processes uh, mean, not just at within communities, but across communities and even across countries, potentially, uh, in terms of, especially now when we look at it in the context of climate change and the increasing impacts that climate change is going to uh, produce. Next. 
So just to, to give an example of some of the work we have done on looking at restoration post Hurricane Isaac, which affected Louisiana uh, in the U.S., uh, we really looked at very high resolution uh, restoration data, and this is the point I'll come back to in my concluding slide on on metrics. But this data is often not available, even in countries like the U.S. This has to be scraped off utility websites because there is no standard uh, process for reporting on on restoration. Uh, but uh, there was we managed to get this uh, previous slide, please, for a second. And and really try to answer the question of does income matter uh, to the to the uh, speed of restoration and how quickly you get power back. Next. And it turns out that, in fact, it does matter, especially for initial recovery. It doesn't seem to matter as much for, uh, uh, for final, but for 50% restoration, 80% restoration, median income uh, plays is significant, um, as is, of course, the characteristics of the hazard. Next. So to me, there's a few kind of lessons I'd like to leave uh, come back to and leave uh, the audience with and, and for, for discussion. I think the idea of metrics is very important. We need to be able to understand, monitor, and track recovery processes at different scales. Uh, in, and because only then we can really understand both the dynamics and some of these cross-scale interactions. Uh, I think we, are, we know very well that socioeconomic factors like uh, income or marginalization or, or other uh, aspects affect the vulnerability of households, but they also affect recovery processes. And when we study the dynamics of these recovery processes, we need to understand these cross-scale interactions. And then stepping back, you know, are there policies or policy choices that could help us do better on both reducing impact but also improving recovery? Or are there trade-offs between impacts and recovery? That is, for example, will hardening of infrastructure potentially uh, increase, uh, uh, improve our ability to recover? Or could it, in such certain conditions with the changing climate, actually make things worse? And then more fundamentally, how do we ensure that um, policies and policy frameworks uh, squarely consider some of these distributional and equity issues uh, in terms of um, you know who who takes uh, the longest to recover, whether it's at the level of uh, asset or it's at the level of more complex systems uh, such as education and health, or even at the level of uh, overall economic performance as measured in growth or in in jobs. Um, so with that, let me uh, uh, stop here and turn back to Thank Dr. You. Watts. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Pratvardhan. I think this is this raises a, a, a very wide range of issues and merits a much uh, more uh, comprehensive discussion. I think, you know, many parts of the world where uh, disasters are very frequent and the process of recovery is not so efficient, uh, the incidence of poverty is very, very high. And a failure to recover has a very strong implications for the, the level of poverty in, in, in parts of the world and this correlation needs to be explored further. Um, so I think uh, on, on that point I would just like to have uh, one uh, minute question for Elizabeth maybe. Uh, what about the advocacy for re uh, recovery? You have heard about the equity implications and how the people uh, slide below the poverty line. How would you like to uh, uh, raise uh, the, this, the voice of advocacy with the governments, with others, you know, for, for a more efficient recovery process? Thank you. Just one minute, you know, and we have to sure. wrap up the session quickly. Yes, you know, it's, it's hard under even good circumstances to, to get the momentum going to invest in preparedness and really raise the profile. We have found that the cost benefit analysis work has been very effective, really making the economic argument for investing in this space. Uh, but we're actually at a global moment now where capturing the preparedness agenda given the complex emergencies that we're all facing is an opportunity. And, and from the natural disaster side, you know, some of the key messages that I think relate 
um, include, you know, operating at scale requires investment in maintenance and ongoing preparedness activities. So Thank you. Abhi aap kar pe for the Julia. system. Yeah, please go ahead, complete your sentence. One desires for the system to work rapidly in every 10, 20 years in response to a major disaster, then it needs to work every day on a more minor one. And that includes the training, the capacity development, the institutional arrangements that we talked about. Juliet, I will just turn to you, you know, for, uh, for a uh, brief response, you know, as we are faced with the largest recovery uh, obligation, you know, the socio-economic recovery from COVID-19. How do you see this whole issue of equity uh, getting more and more prominent uh, and more and more, uh, uh, you know, um, um, important uh, for all the people who are dealing with the, the issue of recovery here. Yeah. Thank you. And I'm so pleased to be that we're ending this session talking about the community. And I think just to be super brief, that to me is our, this is our role as, as engineers. The reason we're designing resilient infrastructure is because of the vulnerable communities that depend on it. We have plenty of evidence that it is the, you know, the most vulnerable who are hit hardest who struggle to recover. And I think, again, as engineers, we must never let this out of our sight, that this is, yeah. this is our, our role and, and what we need to be doing. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now I would like to wrap up the session, but I have one question uh, from uh, uh, my ex-colleague Rita Misar uh, from UNDP. Uh, and she uh, has asked me what role can CDRI play in expanding capacities of infrastructure experts to plan green and sustainable infrastructure recovery. I think the, the one very dependable way of uh, uh, CDRI playing a greater role is to work in more and more countries, intervene in more uh, recovery situations, help the governments build the bridges, develop partnerships with academic institutions and private sector firms such as Miyamoto and Arup who are all here. And I think, you know, bringing the expertise to the countries, to the doorstep, you know, and, and uh, increasing the knowledge base of, uh, uh, of these um, you know, processes and of these systems, I think that's the way to go. Um, I think, uh, we had great presentations and, and a lot of takeaways I mean, in, in, in pa due to paucity of time, I would not be able to summarize them. But I would like to thank all of you and all the panelists, discussions and all the participants uh, for uh, uh, being here and for sharing your experience and wisdom. And uh, uh, I'm sure we will find many other forums to continue this discussion. This is uh, in, in the context of COVID-19 recovery. This is something that we need to persist with for a long time. So thank you again. And uh, thank you to all of you uh, for, for uh, no, um, sharing your, your, your perspective from across the world. Thank you.